You can even have one in the back or down front. I don't bite, I promise. Okay. Yes. Cat me should be up to date for one, two, and three. So if you don't have a grade, send me an email so I can get it straightened out. That means it, that a line is probably that you have a zero. So send me an email so I can get it figured out for you. I, want to, I have all the records. I just want to make sure and verify. Because I have a program that it's running. So if yours didn't show up more than once, then I'm afraid it's something with you not I need to fix my program. All right, you guys ready to get started? You guys hear me? Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> reminders. Checkpoint two. You need to complete this week in your skills lab. You must do it before your presentations. You guys know presentations are this week. I see some people very nicely dressed, which means they probably had presentations today. I hope they went well. You have to do it before your oral presentation. So at the least, you need to hand your TAs your packet of stuff before you talk. Don't try and work on it during other people's presentations. And do not attempt to work on your presentation during other people's presentations because they will cut you off. So make sure you're ready to go. Uh, let's see. So that's all this week. Grand Challenges quiz is due today at 11.59 p.m. So... I wouldn't start that at 11.57, as always. Give yourself a little bit of time in there. Um, Cat Me 4 got released. Hopefully you guys got an email or it releases tonight. That's due a week from today at midnight. So we're checking back in with your teams. We'll probably do that every other week or so. Checkpoint 3 is coming up rather rapidly also. It's Wednesday and Thursday, November 7th and 8th. So next Wednesday and Thursday is Checkpoint 3. You need to be up and hovering and able to go forward about a foot. You don't need to be programmed or anything, but you need to be able to be up and hovering. So you guys will have Wednesday between Wednesday and Thursday between 10 and 5, I believe. A little bit shorter hours this time. Yeah. Uh, I'll go to the next one. I'll show you. <laughs> you do have to hover in place first. You need to hover in place for two minutes or three minutes. I can't remember which. But you have to stay in place. That means you need to be well balanced. You guys will find building your hovercraft you're probably there. Who has their hovercraft built? Some of you guys? Okay. So it will come together, but staying in place will be a headache. The balance is really difficult. So don't wait until the checkpoint to show up and think you're going to balance it right then. It will be difficult. All right. So 10-day plan again. Um, grand challenges and your reading, reading quiz, your last reading quiz are due tonight. So make sure you get those done. Oral presentation is this week. Your fourth cat me survey, checkpoint three and your grade forecast. Your grades are online. Make sure you are checking them. If you wait till December 20th to argue with us, it's kind of difficult. So make sure you check now. It's better to be on top of things. All right, oral presentations. Um, remember, you've got between five and seven minutes. Okay? Points will be off after that. At 10 minutes, your TA will drag you off your stage. So make sure you time yourself and you're not going over. There is a dress code. You can't wear tennis shoes or jeans or short shorts or short skirts. Okay? Dress business casual, so wear something nice. Um, check chapter 12 in your textbook if you need more details on that. Please read the grade sheets. Okay? Again, I tell you guys this every class. If you read the grade sheets, you will do better in this class, much better than if you don't. You don't want to miss out on points because you didn't read what was required of you, so make sure you read those. All right, so checkpoint three, here you go. So in the lab, okay, so we'll meet there. You have between 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. next Wednesday and Thursday. All your group members, except for maybe one, need to be there. It will go a lot faster than checkpoint one, okay? You can meet with a TA or with Dr. Lacomer I. There's all sorts of people there instead of just having to always wait for, for Dr. Lacomer I. So it will go faster. You have to hover for three minutes in place. Then you need to move forward one foot. Okay? You need to prove to us that your propulsion method will work. You don't have to have your hovercraft programmed yet, but you need to at least manually show us what you're going to do, like twist your fan or whatever it is, and make sure it can go. Make sure it's going to work. Okay? So that's next Wednesday and Thursday. So you guys got a lot of work to do this week. 
Everything must be on the hovercraft. So your battery sensors, all that stuff, whatever you need, it must be on the hovercraft. No program needed. Your fuel cell needs to be on your hovercraft, but it doesn't need to be operational at this time. Okay? And again, check out the grading criteria. Make sure you've met each requirement before you come to class. I'm going to take his question and then yours. Go. He asked, do you need to hover for three minutes, actually, for three minutes and then automatically go into propulsion mode or if you have a second? I'm assuming you're going to have to make adjustments because we don't have the program yet. So you can hover for three minutes with just your lift fans on, make whatever change you need to turn on your propulsion fans, and then go. Okay. But it won't be like a 10-minute interim. It's going to be demonstrate this. Well, it's your turn. Yes. He asked, if your propulsion system was not complicated enough at checkpoint one, is that okay? No, don't demonstrate something that's not going to meet the requirements. You need to have that ironed out. So if you need help this week, keep in mind, Dr. Lacombe and I and all the TAs have office hours all the time. The EDL is staffed from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. every single weekday, Monday through Friday. So if you're still having questions about propulsion, please go to the lab and ask questions. Yeah. Does your propulsion fan need to have fan guards? Yes, it does. Fan guards, even if you're just testing, that's when fingers get chopped up. Put fan guards on. Even if it's not that you get your finger in there, I've seen other things go in, like a piece of tape or something, and it breaks off a blade, and the blade goes shooting across without if someone doesn't have fan guards on. And it's just dangerous, so just put your fan guards on. It's not, not that difficult. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Checkpoint three next week. All right, moving through the semester rather rapidly. All right, so first clicker question is, have you completed checkpoint two? One is yes, two is no, and three is I don't know. seconds. All right. Let's see. Well, I'm glad only 4% of you don't know. That's a good sign. 41% <laughs> said yes, 55% said no. So don't forget those this week. They are due this week. All right. So, a couple weeks ago, Dr. Lacombe talked to you guys about problem-solving strategies. And you guys did a bunch of brain teasers. You guys remember that? This is a continuation of that. So moving forward, we've got lots of clickers for you guys today. Um, you might want to pull out a piece of paper and a pencil, because you're going to have to do some of these brain teasers. And it might be nice to be able to jot down notes. All right. So sometimes you're going to be given a problem, like this eat an elephant. And it's a big problem. And you look at it, and it's really overwhelming. And so we talk about problem-solving techniques because there's lots of ways to break a problem into something manageable so we can get a solution. So most problems, right, big problems have solutions. Last week we talked about the grand challenges. Those are huge problems. But people are breaking them down into smaller, manageable items to solve. And so that's what we're talking about today is how to do that. Um, continuing on from, from Dr. Lacombe's talk the other day. So a typical approach was share the, or sorry, state the problem's essentials clearly. The problem is not always obvious. Sometimes, like in the second semester of this class for mechanicals, we have a drag race. And we say, you know, you assume that the problem is to have the fastest car, because it's a drag racer. Who doesn't want to get, get across the line? But the real problem is, is I need to get across the line faster than my opponent or before my opponent. Right? So you need to be able to, to look at a problem and define it clearly and decide, what do I need to solve this problem and what do I have? Which goes into identify the inputs and information available. Okay? 
Sometimes when you're solving a problem, people will give you too much information. You guys have probably all been there when you're math and your physics classes and chemistry. You're like, what does this have to do with anything? And it's a trick. Or it just might be that someone came to you, approached you with a problem, and they don't really know how to solve the problem. So they gave you a lot of extraneous information. It's your job to decipher what's important and what's not and use that information. Okay. Next up, you need to be able to identify the desired outputs and answers. For you guys, that's pretty clear in here. We said your cover craft needs to be able to go to the end and come back and, and not touch, touch the back. Okay? So sometimes the outcome is there. Sometimes you have to decipher what the outcome will be. Next up, you sketch the problem. You guys have a hovercraft sketch, and we talked about how it'll be really helpful for you guys, and we're talking about balancing. You guys have to have your hovercraft balance, checkpoint three coming up this week, and I guarantee you balance will be a much bigger headache than you are anticipating. Talk to people from semesters before. Okay? It's a headache, but you can help yourself by drawing out your hovercraft first and finding that center of gravity and putting your heaviest thing there. So drawing helps, which is why we have you guys do a drawing. In every single one of your classes, when you guys move on from here, and pretty much everyone's going to say, draw that free body diagram or sketch out what the problem is asking and the parameters. Those drawings will help you significantly. One, for partial credit. If you don't know anything else, you can at least put on a pretty drawing. <laughs> and two, because it helps you get all the information stated clearly and in a manner that makes sense to most people. All right, so after we get through all that stuff, we develop our solution and then test and confirm your solution. So we'll keep this in mind. This is a generic approach. Last week or two weeks ago, you guys talked about using pictures or diagrams. If you guys will recall, Dr. Lacombe said, what if you had a pool and it needs a six-foot block of concrete all the way around it? And you might measure it out and end up with, in the corners, you might have doubled that material. You may have left it out completely. It's nice to have a drawing. Or you guys talked about, oh, sound. <laughs> you guys talked about a worm. Is it too loud? Everyone's listening now, that's nice. All right, we talked about a worm inching up a wall, and it goes up three feet and comes down two, and it's nice to have that diagram that makes it easier to follow. Okay. And then we talked about eliminating possibilities, and you guys talked about the game Clue, you guys remember that, um, and Sherlock Holmes and all that good stuff. So lots of things. Today, we are going to take those approaches, and we're going to apply them using matrix logic, and then also just working backwards. Everyone's favorite, find the answer in the back of the book and figure out how they got it, <laughs> right? Um, so we're going to go through a couple examples today, brain teasers um, with clicker questions and, and some other things. All right, so first off, let's go real world. Let's say we all graduated and got a cool job with a civil engineering firm, and they said, um, you need to design and develop a new highway which will be integrated into and built above an older one. Sounds like what's happening around South Virginia Street right now. <laughs> Your responsibilities are huge in organizing this project. You need to figure out, first of all, when are the high and low volumes of drive times because you don't want a bunch of accidents to happen. You don't want to block a bunch of traffic. You need to bring in subcontractors in, time that, in times that are convenient to drivers. And then you also need to figure out when are these subcontractors available, who needs to come first and second, who needs to work together, when are they not on vacation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You also need to order materials in a, in a timely way. You don't want a pile of materials sitting out off of 395. One, people might steal your copper things and pawn it. <laughs> Two, it just takes up a lot of space. It might get ruined sitting there. Whatever it is, it's costly. So you want to make sure things are getting on time. So you're going to be organizing schedules and orders, equipment rentals, all sorts of stuff. Everything that comes into this project. Not to mention your engineers who have designed it for you. So everything's on a schedule. One way to organize this would be to start off with eliminating possibilities in order to problem solve. When can I have this person here and that person there, etc. And a way we do this is, is using matrix logic. So matrix logic is essentially you draw out a table, and it's a two-dimensional table, just like this one down here. And it's it allows you to limit possibilities. So you go through and you write what the various possibilities are, and then you can go through and X them off in the table until you find something that works. Um, so, for example, if I had three different contractors and four rigs, we're being very generic here, okay? And the blue boxes are to say that contractor two refuses to work with rig one, and contractor one refuses to work with rig four. They think they're dangerous. They don't like them. Okay? So you would go through your other possibilities of when are the high and low volume drive times? 
Okay, when is this equipment available? What days can I run this? And you'd start Xing out boxes. So I have an example for you guys of using matrix, matrix logic and eliminating possibilities. Um, this is where your piece of paper comes in. We're going to walk through it. I'm going to give you the clues and give you some suggestions. Okay? And I'll give you guys some time to figure it out. And then we're going to do some clickers also. So here is the question. And I'll put up the clues, so don't worry yet. But Allison, Janie, Ted, and Ken are the names of people forming two married couples. Married is in males to females here. Okay. Each one of the four sports, running, swimming, biking, and golfing, is considered by exactly one of these individuals as their favorite sport. So I'm going to give you guys some information, and you need to decide which person's favorite sport is which. So each sport okay, belongs to one person, and vice versa. So one person or two people can't be into running. It's one person per sport. Got two married couples. So the clues are, and, and again, we'll get back to these to review them, but the clues are this. Ted hates golf. He agrees with Mark Twain that it's just a good, um, nothing but a good walk spoiled. Okay, so he does not like to golf. Ken wouldn't run around the block if he didn't have to, and neither would his wife. Each woman's favorite sport is featured in a triathlon. A triathlon is running, swimming, and biking. If you didn't know, now you know. Allison bought her husband a new bike for his birthday to use in his favorite sport. Okay, so we have these four clues, and we're going to use them in matrix logic to figure out whose favorite sport is whose. So what we can do is we can use the following strategies. We can mark traits from the clues, and then we can combine the clues into a matrix, okay, eliminate possibilities, so we'll go through the list and we'll say, well, what was the first one? Ken hates golfing. OK, check. <laughs> That's one eliminated. Right? And we can go through each one and eliminate things and then go back and say, did that generate any other possibilities? And can we eliminate those or can we use them? So we're going to substitute clues with deduce clues and then continue. So basically, in order to solve this, you're probably going to have to go through the clues twice. And we'll mark up the matrix. So why don't you guys all draw out a matrix that looks like this? So on our x-axis, we've got Allison, Janie, Ted, and Ken. Or sorry, on the y. And on the x, running, swimming, biking, and golfing. And I'm going to give you guys, I'm going to go back to the clues after you guys get this matrix written down and give you guys a minute to think about it. And then we'll go through step by step. I'm going to. Anyone need more time with this? Yep, we got people who need time, so hold on. All right, ready for clues? Yes. Here you go. See how far you get.
Okay, how are we doing? Good? Okay, who thinks they have the answer? Good, a lot of you guys. All right, let's go through and see. Okay, so first off, Ted hates golf. So I'm just going to place an X with the rule number. So X and 1, that was rule number 1, is that he hates golf. And I'm going to put that in the box that represents Ted and golf. See? You guys all got that one, hopefully. <laughs> all right. Next clue said, Ken doesn't run. So I'm going to place an X with the rule number 2 as a subscript in for Ken and running. Okay, that goes here. Ken doesn't run. All right. The women's favorite sports are in a triathlon. And remember, triathlon is running, swimming, and biking. Okay? So um, I can place an X with the rule number three as a subscript for the ladies in golfing. Okay? And that leaves me one option down here. <laughs> so let's go on here. What is Ken's favorite sport? Having all of this. Ready, go. All right, five seconds. If you haven't gotten in your answer, get in your answer. Golfing. Good. <laughs> All right. Ken is a golfer, and that was through process of elimination. If everyone else is not a golfer, that leaves one person, and that is Ken to be our golfer. Okay. So we put... O with an explanatory subscript. So if you were making a chart and something more complicated, you'd have A, deduce because others don't golf. It's nice to keep track of where these things came from so that if you go back and need to make changes, then you can. All right, next up here. Since Ken is a golfer, he doesn't do the other sports. So I can go through and I can X out these two middle sports because we know that those aren't possibilities for him anymore. So they're removed, and the option is because... Ken is a golfer. All right. So next up we've used here, Ted hates golf. Um, we've used that Ken wouldn't run around the block. We've used the triathlons. Allison bought her husband a new bike. Good to know. Okay. So let's look at through these again and decide what we can use. So since Ken is a golfer, Ted must be the biker because Allison bought her husband a bike. So we had one other guy. The he must be the husband. So... Ted must be the biker, and he must be married to Allison. Good to know. Okay. So we place an O with a subscript for this, and we say deduce because Ken is a golfer. Rule number four. You guys with me? Did you guys get this far? Yeah? Good. Anyone need a minute? Okay. All right, so next up, we can go, let's look at this. Allison bought her husband, so we know that there, who's married to whom there. Okay. Ken wouldn't run around the block, and neither would his wife. That's a nice clue. Okay. And each woman's favorite sport is in a triathlon, which we knew. All right. So moving forward here, since Ted, Ted is the biker, um, he does not do the other sports, so we're going to cross those off. So now we're down to, let's see, our three sports and the women. But we know he's a biker. All right. So going from these clues here, you've got a clicker question coming. Okay. We're talking about the women and their sports. So why does Janie not like running? Is it because she doesn't have running shoes and her feet hurt? She had a knee injury. She prefers team sports. She's married to Ken or she's married to Ted. Ready, go. Oh. 
Five seconds. Mary to Ken. Since Allison is Ted's wife, then Janie is Ken's wife. So good job on that one. Okay. And since by rule two, Ken's wife doesn't run, she can be eliminated. And this is deduced because Ken's wife doesn't run. That was our rule. Okay. So the rest of the logic from here is pretty straightforward. We find out that Janie is our swimmer and Allison is our runner. So who got this? You guys said you had it at the beginning? Good. You guys are so smart. All right. So matrix logic is super useful. This is a straightforward example, but you might have something really complicated like the highway you're rebuilding and you've got 10 different subcontractors and different times of days that you guys can be on the freeway working and whatnot and different equipment rentals and all these things. And so sometimes it's nice to put together a chart like this. Um, when you guys are talking about your hovercraft project, the fact that there's four of you with four different schedules and maybe you need to meet in the EDL between 10 and 7, Monday through Friday, that can create a logic problem, trying to figure out when's the best time to meet. You guys also have systems working together. You need to start thinking about troubleshooting your hovercraft. You've got a lift system, a propulsion, propulsion system. You've got your energy, your fuel cell, the balance. You've got all these subsystems, and everything needs to work together in order to accomplish a common goal. And that's why we're talking about problem solving. Engineering is problem solving, and there's many different ways to do it. So we're just giving you guys some examples so you can think about the way that you solve problems. There are many different ways to do it. We just want to show you guys some options. All right, so clicker question number four. No incorrect answers here. Which problem solving technique are you most likely to use? What are you most comfortable with? One is working backwards. Two is eliminating possibilities. Three is this matrix logic, and four is drawing diagrams or pictures. Ready, go. This is a tough question. <laughs> Not really. Five seconds, if you haven't put in your answer. All right, let's see here. 16% prefer working backwards. They always, do you guys start at the back of your textbook before? <laughs> yes. 44% are into eliminating possibilities. 9% think they'll use matrix logic. 32% drawing diagrams or pictures. Good. Just a curiosity question here. All right. So the final deadline sometimes will determine how you guys problem solve. Okay? So for this class, we said at the very beginning, you guys need to come up with a Gantt chart, right? And we gave you guys deadlines on your syllabus and said these are the checkpoints and these are when things are due. Map it out. You're like, how do, how do we know how long checkpoint one takes? Right? And that was something you had to figure out, but you knew you had a deadline and that helped you set up a schedule. You will almost certainly want to work backwards from a final deadline. If someone tells you in your work life, we need this project done by, you know, September 2013, that's probably the first date you're going to look at. And then you look at everything that goes into this problem and how you're going to solve it and how can you get it done in that amount of time. And things are going to factor into that. There's a budget and there's resources. There's how much time you have available and all that good stuff and how much is it going to cost to get it done faster. Um, so the following is an example of working backwards. And this one, um, again, you'll probably need a piece of paper that you guys have out, and we've got some clicker questions in here for you. So another working backwards, and this will illustrate the strategy for you. So after dinner, three, in my opinion, very greedy friends were leaving a restaurant, and they noticed a big bowl of mints. Sean took one-third of the mints, but returned four because he had a, momentarily pain, a momentary pain of guilt. Faisal then took one-fourth of what was left, but returned three for similar reasons. Eugene then took half the remainder but threw two green ones back. The bowl had only 17 mints left when the raid was over. How many mints were originally in the bowl? So we're going to work backwards on this. There's one 
piece of information here that sticks out to me that's absolutely useless. Can you guys think of what that is? Green, good. It's good to be able to recognize what is not important, and the green is not important. All right, so to work backwards, first thing I would do, I'll go back, we're going to put up these clues, is you want to write out the steps in order. Okay, so you want to write down the information. When you guys get problems, your physics problems, and as you go forth in engineering, you're going to draw your diagram, and you're going to write down the given information. And then consider the problem in reverse. So this involves both reversing the number or the order of objects you have and the actions. Both things need to get reversed if you're going to go truly backwards. It's like a backwards TV show. You guys ever seen those episodes and they start from the back and go forward? All right. Draw diagrams as needed. You may need to do some simple math, some algebra, or maybe some difficult math. You might want to act it out. If you've got some time on your hands, you could go forth and with the bowl of candy in your dorm and be very popular and allow people to steal your, your bowl of candy. Um, algebra and other tools. And then the very last step is check from the beginning to end. Okay. One thing we always want to encourage you guys as you guys are problem solving is look at the solutions that you're getting to problems and make sure they make sense. Okay. So there's a little bit of a reality check there. If you were calculating like say the lifting for your hovercraft and you came up with, I don't know, 5,000 CFM and all the examples in class were more on the range of 100, you might say, well, logically that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And so that's part of having an engineering perspective we talked about at the beginning. All right, so if I write down the story steps accurately in order, I have start, Don took one third of the mints, turn four, Faija took one fourth of what was left, return three, Eugene took half the remainder, threw two back, and the bowl had 17 mints left. So I'm going to give you guys a couple minutes. Try and figure out how many mints were in the bowl at the start. Then we'll do some more clicker questions and go through it. Give a guess. No.
Okay, who got a thousand? What? One guy? How about between 200 and 400? Some of you guys? Less than, between 100 and 200? A couple of people? Less than 100? Less than 50? And more than 25? <laughs> okay, so we're going to go through it. Keep you in suspense. All right, so we work backwards from end to beginning. The bowl had 17 mints okay, left, so I'm just going to place the 17 down here. And Eugene threw two back. And so there were 15 at this point. Eugene took half the remainder, so if I double 15, I have 30 mints. Double the remainder. Anyone want to argue yet? Fija returned three. So that drops me down to 27. And Fija took one fourth of what was left, which leads me to the next clicker question. So your question is, how many mints did Fija take? 15, 10, 81, or 9? I'm going to give you guys a minute on this. Faisha took one-fourth of what was left. What do you think that he had? Thirty seconds. Seconds and there's about 70 of you who haven't put in an answer. Guess, guess, guess. Five seconds. Three, two, one. Get in there. Oh, it looks like a little short. Let's see what we got. 8% said 15, 6% said 10, 32% said 81, and 54% said 9. The majority is correct on this. All right. Okay, so <laughs> you end up, a fourth was nine. So if I add nine to 27, I get 36, which I'll show you guys how that breaks down in a second here. And then he returned four, so I subtract down to 32. And then Sean took one third of the mint. I had a cluster over here between 25 and 50. Did you guys get 48? That was the correct answer. There's a couple people over here too. 48 mints. Is that what you got over here? Yeah, some people? Okay. So let's look at this. If I go from beginning to end, okay, 48 minus 16, check, that's 32, plus 4, check, 36, minus 9, check, it's 27, plus 3. Okay. You can go back through this and see, work backwards or forwards as it may be, and make sure that you get back to 17 mints. What you could do is remember I said you could act it out if you had a bunch of mints laying around or, or pennies or something of that nature. Okay. You could also use algebra. When we were talking about one-fourth of what was left here. Okay, that means that that 27 was three-quarters. So if I did some algebra, I could find the number, what number, times x equals 27. Or I could have drawn pictures. I could have drawn boxes and said, well, if I have 27 mints and that breaks up three ways, and then I have a fourth and they're all even, what does that even out to? And 27 divided by 3 is 9. So I knew that my quarter was left. So there's many different ways to solve this. Um, this will be online for you guys to review later if you don't believe me and you want to go through again. But I do have another clicker question for you, and it's another there's no wrong answer, so don't stress. But how far did you get on your own? Okay. One is solved it. Two is you solve most of it. Three is about a fourth. And four is, eh, what are we doing today? All right. So 
Tell me how far you got. I'm curious. We need a, let's see, 297. Nine more of you. You've got nine seconds. <laughs> Three, two, one. Okay, let's see how we did. 19% of the class got it right. Good job. Most of it, 44%, 26%, 11 and what are we doing? At least you logged in for this one. <laughs> okay. Good job if you got that one right. A lot, I think like 312 or somewhere around there is a common answer people get. I'm not sure where the math goes, but um, hopefully it makes better sense now. So you can work backwards to solve a problem. Point of this. Okay. So we were, I talked today, and Dr. Lacombe talked a couple weeks ago, <clears throat> again, about problem solving techniques. And we talked about things like drawing a picture, eliminating possibilities, and using these matrices. Um, working backwards, drawing diagrams, acting it out, many, many, many ways to solve, to solve problems, and we didn't even cover them all yet, okay? But we're not going to. <laughs> um, so these are helpful. You might also want to think about making a systematic list. If I were you guys, you guys are working in groups, and not everyone can be around all the time on your hovercraft. So you might come up with some troubleshooting things that the team needs to look at right off the bat. So the first one might be, like, are the batteries charged? Some fairly obvious things, okay? And just start making a list and keeping track of those. Those can go in your journal, and it'll be a troubleshooting list that goes into your final paper. But it's nice when someone experiences something that goes wrong and when you're talking about pro problem solving, if they document that and how they fixed it, that could save you guys a lot of time later because that person might not be there to work on your hovercraft that day and might be out of cell phone communication or whatever. So keep a list. So making a systematic list is helpful. Looking for patterns. Okay. Guessing and checking. There's always good old trial and error. You know, everyone's favorite. Okay. Identifying sub-problems. You guys talked about that last week. Um, solving an easier related problem. Sometimes, for instance, in like your math classes, you get a formula with a bunch of variables. And you're like, yeah, this doesn't make sense to me. It looks so foreign. You could put in real numbers that are tangible numbers to you and see if it works out. Okay? And that is an, uh, an example of solving an easier related problem. Okay? So think about how you can do that. Um, solve a scaled down version of the problem. Again, your hovercrafts, you're going to have a drawing with the balance. You might want to take a look at the different weights and how they balance out. Okay? Create a model. You guys have a hovercraft, so that's good, but creating a model for other things. And, and lots more. There are plenty, plenty of ways to solve um, engineering problems and, and problems in general. Okay? I would, again, start keeping a list of things that happen with your hovercraft and how you can fix them. Come up with a troubleshooting list, like what's connected to what, and you know, if the propulsion fan isn't running, does it have something to do with our fuel cell, or is it our batteries, or is it our program? Where are these problems coming in? Yes, question. He asked if you want to film yourself and put it online, does that count as journaled information? I wouldn't say that it counts towards journal information at this point, although it's a good idea. Maybe we'll make that change. But you can always put in the URL and send it to your TA or to Dr. Lacomari and say, hey, this is a problem we're having. Can you help us solve it? And a video is really helpful. Yeah. So videos are, are really nice. And the videos also, you guys can use them in your final presentation. So if you have videos, I would encourage that becomes part of your presentation. All right. So the key to success with problem solving is to pick the right strategy. If you come up across a problem that you don't think is solvable, it's probably because you haven't come up with the right strategy yet. Right? We were talking about last week and grand challenges, how to make solar energy more affordable. And people are starting to look at photosynthesis. And that's an area that they haven't looked at yet or haven't looked into that much. And so if you think of things in terms of other things and try and solve, solve problems and break them down, if you apply the right approach, then you will get an answer, hopefully. <laughs> that is the plan. At least in here you will. All right. Anybody have questions? All right. Don't forget your reading quiz and cat me and all that.
that good stuff. Have a good week.